by asking me to help you say goodbye to Dick. Thank you. It's an honor. I was appointed to this church in 1991. Uh, I've got to know Dick and, and Patty pretty well. Dick Longer. You know, if he could come take a look at us, he would say, all you for me? He'd be impressed that you've come out in such numbers to pay homage to a good, good man. Right? He was. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though he, they physically die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I died. Behold, I am alive forevermore. He said, because I live, you shall live also. Our opening hymn is Amazing Grace. That's page 378 in the hymnal. And it's supposed to be up on these two things. So if you stand with me as you're able, either spiritually or physically or both. <laughs> The prayer is on the TV sets. Will you join me in prayer? 
O God, giver of life, conqueror of death, our help in every time of trouble. We trust that you do not willingly grieve or afflict us. Comfort us who mourn. And give us grace in the presence of death to worship you that we may have hope in eternal life and be enabled to be a trust in your goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The family with the present pastor, Dave Nichol, picked out this psalm for us. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should suffer iniquities, who would stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that we may be, you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. Oh, my people, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with God is great power to redeem. It is God who will redeem us from all our iniquities. Up on the board should be the 23rd Psalm. Before we start, Dick, Dick was a very down-to-earth guy, wasn't he? This Psalm is beautiful but it is really down to earth. The beauty sometimes hides the fact that this is one shepherd talking to another shepherd about what it's like to be alive and to be in confidence and trust in God. So let's read it together, not as poetry, but as a shepherd trying to share with other shepherds what it's like to believe in God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Let's stop there. Sheep drown easily. They are too dumb to know how to swim. And the shepherd has to lead them to where the waters are quiet and fresh and not very deep. God, he says, is, is kind of like that. When a sheep falls and on its back, it's dead. Sheep do not have the ability that dogs and cats do and horses, you know, to roll over. So one of the things every shepherd does every time, sometime during the season, he'll find a lamb on his back, and he picks the lamb up and holds the lamb until the lamb stops shaking and starts eating. He restores my soul. Does that make sense? This is what he's trying to say. God doesn't prevent us on our back but he'll pick us up on our feet. Let's continue. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Stop. In western New York, unless we put macadam and, and asphalt in, our meadows are forever, right? I grew up on a farm, okay? And as far as you can tell, there are meadows. Not so in the Mideast. And in order to get from one meadow to another meadow, sometimes you have to go through 
what we call canyons, arroyas, and guess where the predators are in the valley of the shadow of death. It's simply a fact of life for every shepherd that if the flock is big enough and slow enough, the wolf, the bear, will get one. He said, in, in, the, in the face of that, I trust, I trust that I'll get through the valley of the shadow of death. Continue, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me go back. Surely goodness and mercy shall, what's the word? Follow. In all honesty, sometimes it feels as if goodness and mercy are not walking with us. And in all life, there are times when things are grim, things are tough. And his faith was, goodness and mercy are behind me, and they do catch up. They do catch up to us. Amen. You've heard me enough. Jason wants to talk about the family. Jason. I don't have a mic, but you have a good voice. Go to the lectern, over here. The voice of technology. Do not look behind the curtain. I would like to thank you all for coming today to honor such an extraordinary man, son, brother, husband, father, grandfather, and friend. Dick Allen Bish, born at home on September 17, 1934, in Porter, Pennsylvania, a true country boy in every sense of the word. He was the second oldest of seven to Earl and Catherine Bish. He spent his childhood playing with his brothers and sister yeah, you heard me right, sister. Only one girl, and all those boys, poor thing. He spoke fondly of his childhood through his life as he sat with every new generation that joined the supper table. Dick was a simple man, a few words filled with jokes. And he enjoyed life with the ability to roll with both the good and the bad. He was someone you could always count on, and he was always there, just a phone call away. In his early days, he would walk to school, a one-room schoolhouse. He could still recite his first grade vocabulary list, Polly, Parrot, Cracker, and so on. It was such a small class that he was the only eighth grader. This one-room schoolhouse is where he met a red-headed farm girl by the name of Patty Lee Kennedy when he was just in the third grade, and whom he would later marry at the tender age of 19. As kids, he and his brothers would jump out the back of the bus, his Uncle Jeff, Uncle Jeff was the bus driver, and skip school to play in the woods or they would ride two scooters at a time down those country roads, one foot on each scooter, those Bish boys. His family didn't have a lot of money, but they were happy with their mustard and onion sandwiches, and he'd still make one for himself from time to time. His mom was an excellent baker and would make the best homemade bread. And Dick also enjoyed sandwiches, jam sandwiches. He'd say, how do you make a jam sandwich? Well, you take two slices of bread and you jam them together. You got yourself a jam sandwich. With his Pennsylvania drawl and his happy, smiley face. Some of his favorite sweet treats were homemade apple pie with either a dollop of vanilla ice cream or a slice of cheese melted on top. But his ultimate favorite was butterscotch pie. He would joke when asked if he wanted dessert, he'd say, I have just enough room for a three-corner piece right here, and pat his belly. He 
He also loved sports, and he, loved, and he played for the Porter baseball team. He would later coach his son's teams and go on to watch his grandson's games. Any sport, you name it, he'd watch it. And yes, even curling. He grew up listening to hillbilly music with his parents, and when he was a young lad, he left down home for Buffalo. He would play records with those country sounds blaring in his apartment, and he and his brother would fall asleep, much to the disapproval of his downstairs neighbor, who would come upstairs yelling, if I have to hear that dang hillbilly music one more time, and he continued to listen to hillbilly music on his radio in his sun porch as a great-great-grandfather. The hillbilly and that boy never left. He worked from a very young age. At four years old, he started work picking eggs at Bud Dobson's farm. Yes, he picked eggs. He did not gather them, he picked them. He also planted trees on the farm and earned a nickel a day. At 14, he was a grave digger, and he said that it was the hardest job he had ever done. Dick had an ex excellent worth ethic and brought with him that to Buffalo at the age of 17 when he moved. On his way up, he and his brother Jay were driving a crank car through the country roads when they lost a tire off the car. He'd tell the story, we got out, we're chasing our tile down that big old road. He never met a dog he didn't like. He'd scratch their head and say, "Atta boy." He'd love animals. He would tweet and whistle at birds and squirrels. In his later years, he'd sit in his sunroom and work on his Sudoku puzzles, AKA the Baduka puzzle. As I said, Dick had a great work ethic. He worked from the age of four to the age of 80. He started work at Allied Chemical when he moved to Buffalo at 17 and had to borrow clothes from his Uncle Bob because they wanted him to start right then and there. And he did so for the next 46 years. He loved driving trucks. It was his dream job. And only once did he ever turn down the opportunity to work because he already had plans to go to Pennsylvania. Because of his job, he was on the road a lot. Therefore, he knew a lot of the highways and byways. He, was, he always knew how to give you directions to, where, to get where you were going. He was a GPS before GPS was even a thing. If he wasn't working for Ally Chemical, cleaning the bank, driving for consumer beverages, or unloading trucks at Century 21, or PBS, or later Penske, he was spending time with his family. He was a family man. By 19, he married Patty and brought her to Buffalo, and they started a family. In, in 1955, their eldest of five was born. As Dick tells it, he had a boy, a girl, a boy, a girl, and oh boy, I got a girl. He'd given them each nicknames. There was Darrell, Flip Majive, Cindy, was Fifi, Dennis, Giffer, Sherry, Pumpkin, Connie, Joe, Joe. They lived in a house in Hamburg, New York, and he never let his children go without. He worked hard for his family. He supported them in more ways than one. He went to baseball, football, cheerleading, wrestling, and band practices. You name it, he was there for his kids and his grandkids. He loved to travel, and every year would go, on camp, go camping with his family and took road trips all over the US. He was always up for anything, anything to be with his family. He even put his pinky up at tea parties with his daughters. Now a topic dear to his heart, hunting. Deer to his heart. Well, that's fish humor, folks, and, and these are the jokes. Dick was an avid huntsman and fisherman. Camouflage and flannel were his wardrobe, unless it was Sunday. Then he was in his Sunday best, and at church, also an important part of their family. Every year during the first week of deer season, he'd go to, down to Pennsylvania and go out in the woods looking for dinner with his brothers and sons, and eventually grandsons. And in the springtime, he would look forward to his yearly fishing trip to Ole Bowl. When his wife, Patty, passed away in 2004, his whole world changed. But he continued to spend time with his family, visiting all his family. He made his way around to his siblings, his in-laws, his children, and his, grand and his grandchildren, as well as working part-time, still driving truck. Up until his last days, he was still a truck driver at heart and was also able to provide navigational directions through the back hills of Pennsylvania to West Virginia on his way down to Bish Mountain in Tennessee to visit the most recent Dick Bish family edition, his great-great-grandson, Asher. 
and to enjoy nature and the mountains with five generations of fishes. He always was able to give directions where to go. We know and trust he will provide us directions to see him again in his heavenly home where he'll be serving wieners and beans. We say farewell to a great man and thank you for being such a wonderful son, brother, husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather. Until we meet again, we love you. Are there any others in the congregation who would like to speak? It's hard to a scripture that speaks to our condition. The closest I, I've come is part of the Gospel of John, part of the 14th chapter. Jesus, he knows he's about to die. That, that's, you can't come into Jerusalem with your enemies, the priests, the Pharisees, the Romans, and get away. He knows that. He's got to stay. So he's trying to help his disciples and us as we listen in to understand something of what death is. Listen to his words. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. He said, because Thomas asked, how, how do we find the way? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Follow me. Learn from me. He said, Peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Uh, how many things have you given to one another that got lost or that got forgotten or that got misused? He said, that's not the way I give peace. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Amen. There are, I've been doing this for 50 years plus, and I've learned two or three things, most of which I've forgotten. But there are some things that are eternal about a service like this, four of them. The first, we've come believing in God who loves us, who cares for us, who is always with us, meaning we are also with God. That's the first. We don't understand God. I don't, do you? When I look up at the skies and see galaxies and galaxies and galaxies, and God created all that and cared for me, I don't understand it. I believe it. I believe it about you as well. So we've come as believers, not understanders, not people who have all the answers, but as believers. The second reason we've come together is because it hurts to lose someone you love. Doesn't it? Dick was not a machine that wore out. He was a human being. Did you hear Jason at all? That was a guy. And losing him hurts. 
a lot. I can't begin to describe the grieving process. I just know it goes on for a long time. I lost my mother 20 some odd years ago. And I still find myself thinking, oh, I liked, can't do that. Can't talk to her anymore. There is pain. The third thing I think we've come to do is to say goodbye to Dick with gentle honesty. Come on, he wasn't a saint, was he? I mean, he was a human being. And if you as human beings and he as a human being, if there weren't times when you wish you'd shut your face and times you wish you'd said something, the times you wish you hadn't done something or had done something. I mean, it's, it's normal. We're, we're, we're flawed people. He was a flawed individual. Not that I could see it, but he must have. Maybe he was a tyrant at home, but I don't think so. But he wasn't a saint. And I think we've come to say goodbye with, with gentle honesty. He, he is not a plaster statue. He is not a, a made up figure. He is a real human being. And it's that human being that we're treasuring and keeping in our memory and in our hearts. There's a fourth thing we've come to do. Loving means crying. Look around. Come on, take a look at people in the pew with you. Come on, look at them. You're going to lose some of them, aren't you? I mean, it's going to happen. And I think at every funeral, every memorial service, we make up our mind as people. Will we love knowing we're going to cry eventually? Or will we withdraw from loving, calm it down a little bit to avoid pain? My prayer always is that we will find the courage in God to continue to love deeply one another, to invest our lives in those around us. Knowing, knowing that we'll be in the valley of the shadow of death sometime. And it's part of being a child of God, the ability to love that leads us into the valley and help us to walk through. You know, we could go on forever about Dick. He liked the fact I had short sermons. We did. <laughs> he told me once, Vic, you say it's the most, in the least amount of time that I've heard. <clears throat> so let's stop. There's a prayer of thanksgiving I'd like to give. And then we'll have the Lord's Prayer. And then John will sing once more. Nope, we are going to sing first, How Great Thou Art. I, I grew up with a bulletin. Did you go to church with bulletins? You could look at the bulletin and know what's happening. I have to watch up there <laughs> to see what's happening. So we'll sing How Great Thou Art. And again, if you can, will you stand in body and spirit? My God,
when Patty died, there was a different pastor here, and I wasn't welcome. And I give thanks to David Nickel and his maturity that he's allowed me to do the service for Dick. It is very, very meaningful for me. Will you pray with me? Lord, it's in our times we give thanks. We knew him. He was important. He knew us and was not afraid to show affection and concern. He gave help where and when he could. Thank you. You have surrounded us with people who care. Thank you. And you have sent Jesus the Christ to us to reaffirm that we are yours and you are ours. And Dick is part of the blessed company. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you join with me in the Lord's Prayer? We use trespasses. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. John is going to sing. but John, before you sing, we're going to be leaving immediately after the service for the cemetery. If you're not coming with us, we invite you to go downstairs to our fellowship hall. Uh, it's cooler down there than it is up here. Uh, and there are some refreshments for you. Just share with one another the joy of being alive and the wonder of having known Dick Bish and Patty. John.
God go from here with peace, with strength, with healing. In Jesus' name, amen. The family will be escorted out by the funeral directors, and you're welcome to come in the cortege, right? Okay.